Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show. This is episode 187, 111, 1 Mac 10, it's 187. This is your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you doing today? Today. I'm trying to do that DWE thing, but it's not working. Today. How are you guys doing, man? How's it going? How's life? How is things? Great. Happy for you. Awesome congratulations i'm feeling very good this tuesday morning um as per usual it's a morning for me where i tend to get my things in order realize what i want to do going up to the future and all that sort of malarkey lay out my plans for the day plans for the day today include recording this podcast uploading it cutting into clips going to do my work after i finish work at lunchtime head to the gym come back home do some more work then get ready and go out for our little birthday dinner and in case you're wondering, oh, where are you going birthday? I thought you didn't celebrate your birthday. You know, you're such a hypocrite. No, I'm not celebrating it. We're celebrating it, all right? So myself and a brunette are going to a, a nice a particular restaurant that people tend to love. We're going to go there and eat some nice, luxurious food, give ourselves a bit of a treat, um, you know, give ourselves a bit of a toast, and then come back home. That's basically the plan of this evening. Again, I'm not really... Um, I've, I've never really been a big birthday kind of dude. I've, well, I've, said, I've maintained that stance for a, a long period of time. A lot of it might have to do with the fact that, you know, I didn't necessarily get the best birthdays when I grew growing up in my parents' home. We didn't really have money funds available for people's birthdays, you know. Such indulgencies went up, you know, went went amiss. We did get a period, I think, of time, I don't know. My, my parents kind of entertained the idea of giving you a birthday up until the age where you started to realize just how broke you guys were. You know, you, you know that age where, as a kid, you realize, oh, shit, we're broken. That's why we don't get stuff. Because I think before, you start thinking, in, before, when you're younger... Because you don't know anything and you don't have any context or anything you don't have any understanding of the global situation you're kind of only seeing things from your own purview right you only see things from your own point of view oh, i don't get this my parents don't like me all that sort of stuff right um, which is i don't know super super um naive and stuff but you're kidding it what do you know but then there is a time i don't know when it happens for me it probably happened when i was probably 12 i'm gonna say 12 11 where i started to think hold on there's a pattern here isn't it they consistently keep they consistently um, keep under delivering or under delivering when it comes to presents, right? For instance, I want an extra man to get me a watch. Uh, <laughs> I want a bike. I get, I don't know, I get a, a skateboard from Argos, right? You start to realize this, they keep under, they keep giving me like presents I don't really want. One time I remember I got underwear and boxes. Like, it's like, oh my God, right? So, you know, like, you're <laughs> thinking just like, rah, we are poor, poor. So um, when you reach that age, you start to realize, okay, cool, we're not, we're not that, that money. So I guess I'm not getting the things I want. I'm just got to keep it moving. So that might have played some role in my lack of birthday celebrations, but I don't think so because my little brothers aren't the same. My little brothers, my little brothers go all the way out. They go and they get their friends. They go to a restaurant. They hang out. They smoke hookah. They do all that shit. They're all about their birthdays. And I'm just the complete opposite. I could care no less whatsoever. I did absolutely nothing for mine. I stayed in, didn't move, didn't do anything. Um, and for the most part, just, you know, clocked it up as another day. This might change in the future. I don't know if I end up becoming um, lifestyle independent, or if I end up being, if I end up being, um, if I end up kind of pursuing my, you know, my interest and my hobbies take off, and I and I end up, you know, being self sufficient, where I don't actually, I'm not limited to where I work. I can move around the world and stuff. That might change. You know, I might get to a place where, because I have more time on my hands, because I have more means in my to my hands, and because I've maybe developed or cultivated a new friendship group maybe i might develop and change into a guy who kind of goes and celebrates his birthday with people like the normal people do but i don't think i would do that i just i don't know i just think i'm at that age as an adult it's like i don't just, I think it's a bit ridiculous and i get a bit sad when i see people on social media i think i've seen it so recently a couple of times before like you know people wishing themselves happy birthday or congratulating themselves from getting a job it's like oh, it's a bit gross you know it's a bit gross i'm so proud of myself for doing it. it's like mm, i don't know man I don't know if I'm ever proud of myself to the extent where I have to tell people I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of myself for certain things that I do, but, you know, I just pat myself on the back and keep it moving. But again, I think it's it's different makeup of people. Some people like that kind of public displays of, you know, of fandom. You know, they want to let, let everyone know, oh, look, I'm at this place. It's a fucking amazing. Whereas I like to just keep it to myself and keep my counsel and keep it moving. I think apart from my, uh, apart from the Drake concert that I went to this year, for the assassination vacation tour that was the only thing i think experience was i must have i think i posted on social and even now it's because you know drake is literally my favorite artist hands down of this current crop at the moment so and it was one of those shows where i probably won't i probably wouldn't have gone if my friend didn't buy the ticket so something that you know 
I was lucky and fortunate enough that I got the ability to go. So I kind of wanted to save it a moment somewhat. And I didn't really, you know, I took a bit of a shitty video. I just pointed it at the fucking stage one second and just put my phone back in my pocket. Because I don't really like to have my phone out most of the time when I'm out and stuff. But yeah, that might have to do with it. But anyway, we're going to do a little birthday dinner today. That should be good. And we're going to have a little nice, fun evening. Um, today's Tuesday. Weather's looking a bit shitty as per usual. Um, I suppose it's going to get better towards the end of the week, I've been told. Or that's what the weather is pointing towards. But again, I'm not holding out any kind of hope in that, re- in that regard. Um, you'd hope so, innit? Because we've got we've got another bank holiday coming up this this um uh, coming up right today or this weekend, right? Another bank holiday. Um, I think it's bank holiday Monday, right? So another four day free or three day weekend for people that want to go out there and get fucked up. So yeah, it's meant. To, oh, awesome! It's going to be really sunny. It's going to be sixteen degrees this Sunday, so 12, 16, 17 on the weekend. So it should be quite a nice weekend actually. Um, for everybody that's out there. Anyway, apart from that, let's get into some topics and talk about the things that you want to talk about. Number one topic to talk about, get out of the way, is United um, drawing 1-1 against Chelsea the other day. I didn't mention it. I didn't want to talk about it because, you know, it's a distraught. I'm a distraught United fan. I just don't know where to start with this regard. Um, fairly even match. Uh, two teams who are um, two, two teams who are, who are basically the mirror image of each other, right? Two former forces of the Premier League now, you know, not at their pomp, um, kind of caught behind the times. Um, Chelsea probably are under development and they have a direction that they're going into so I think if you're a Chelsea fan it might not be the glitz and glamour football that you're used to you might not be sw- um, wiping teams you, know, you might not be brushing teams aside you might be winning the championships or the cups that they're winning previously but I, just, I still think if you're a Chelsea fan there's a bit more you have a bit more faith and a bit more hope because they have an infrastructure set up in that, t- in that squad or in that club where in managers are quite interchangeable as we've seen right Chelsea don't wait around they usually just get rid of managers they're not performing but they also have a direction that they're going under with Sari. He's trying to he's trying to promote a particular brand of football. He's looking for a particular type of football players who I'm sure will probably have careers after Sari's left. So it's not it's not like these players that he's buying won't have um won't have a long Chelsea career after he's gone because they probably get a manager of the similar ilk, maybe playing more progressive football, maybe the football's more exciting, maybe he's more personable. I don't know what it'll be. But by and large, I think if you're a Chelsea fan, you're a bit, you're a bit more, um, you're a bit at ease with the situation at hand. But two former forces of the Premier League battling it out to see who's going to finish fourth because absolutely no one wants to finish fourth, right? Especially off the back of um, Arsenal's loss the other day too. So the game was fairly, deep, fairly evenly matched. I think we kind of cancelled each other out for the most part. Man United probably had a bit more control of the game. I think our best bells of the, of the game came towards maybe the first 20 minutes or the first half an hour. Mata playing in that false nine position worked really well. He was really, he really performed amazing. Probably the best performance he's had against his former club Chelsea. And the Herrera came back into the team and slotted in amazingly, perfectly well. Um, again, it's just, um, it's just. Um, it's systematic of the United of nowadays that somebody like an Ander Herrera will get shipped out before someone like Fellaini. No, will get shipped out quicker than somebody like a Fellaini did. Fellaini hanged, hanged around like a bad smell for five seasons in our team. It's uh, he painfully obvious you couldn't play the football that we wanted. It was painfully obvious the way he plays football isn't the way we want to play football. It was painfully obvious that he was a flipping average player. David Moyes got in, a, a manager who kind of somehow avoids any kind of blame in the press for some reason. Um... Somebody like Andy Herrera stays at the club less time than Fellaini. Memphis Depay left before Fellaini left. Um, Blind left before Fellaini left. Now, all these footballers who could possibly contribute something to what's going forward have now, you know, have been shipped out because, you know, they didn't necessarily, they didn't have the metal or the grit or whatever it may be. Fellaini hanging around like a bad smell. Now we've got Andy Herrera, one of our best midfielders, being let go on the free to Paris Saint-Germain, which is like, you know, you're thinking, of, you're looking at it and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. Again, the Ander Herrera situation is odd because I think generally everyone can agree he probably isn't the best midfielder in the world in that position. He probably, but he is the best midfielder for us in that team, right? He's a great team player. He hasn't come close to ever playing for the Spanish national team because, you know, Spain are in, um, incre- incredibly blessed in the midfield department with the players they have at the moment. So I don't think it's any slight on him that he doesn't play for Spain. But he's probably been part of our team's best performances throughout the season. I think his record when we have him playing for us is amazing uh, about the amount of games that we win and don't lose. Um, he's pers- he's or, or he's or, always the one of the only players, apart from maybe uh, Pogba, 
who takes the ball on in tight areas in midfield and tries to run forward. He's very progressive with his passing. He's always trying to move the pitch. He's always trying to move the line up a bit further up the pitch, the midfield line. Just a generally a good player who kind of gets what it is to be a United player, cuts when we're losing, um, goes the extra mile when we're, when we're winning to try and make sure that we do win, being nasty, diving, rolling around, being, being a bit of a cunt. He's a great player. But somehow we're letting him go. Doesn't make any sense. Matic is still around. You know, obviously his legs are gone. Maybe he's played too much football. But regardless, he's not as good a player as he should be. We should have probably played Scott Matani from the beginning. Paul Popper had one of his best games as well against Chelsea. But the fans seem to have it in for him. I don't know what's going on there. I understand he's a bit of a prima donna. I understand he's a bit of a luxury player. But he's quite clearly, quite clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, our best player. Like, if we if we want to win a game now, especially with Rashford's form dipping, his lack of his injuries, um, confidence is not very high. Lukaku just looks like a, you know, he looks like a pub player at the moment. I don't know what's happened to him. It's the only player you see on that pitch who could, who could uh, you know, give us something and make us tick and score a goal or make some force something to happen is probably Paul Pogba. And close second maybe might be Scott McTominay and, jo- and, and White Matter, right? Who could make something happen. In that regard, everyone else is kind of like, you know, really, really out of form, but people seem to have something out for Pogba. Anyway, the game progressed. We um, made an excellent move involving Lukaku, actually a great um, interplay. He kind of receives the ball with the right, thinks it over the top with his left. Luke showed burst into the area. He probably should have shot, which is, he's, he's always a bit shy to shoot, really, but he cut it back. Great cut back onto Juan Mata. Wasn't an easy chance because the ball was going away from the goal and Mal Mata directed it back, back away from the goal, which is a good technique I've heard from strikers if you want to finish the ball really, if you want to finish the goal really well, try and hit it back from where it came from sort of thing. So that was an amazing finish and then you're thinking, okay, cool. Let's build on this and try and get one more goal because, you know, Chelsea are no mugs. They've got Hazard on the pitch. They've got Willian. Um, they've got loads of weapons to bring on from the substitute bench like Pedro. Um, so you you fought and, and Giroud has obviously got a really good record against us. You fought, you know, let them, let's get another goal just to kind of get the game out of the way. We don't do that. We kind of huff and puff. We don't really get, get control of the game. Chelsea reset back control of the midfield, passing around the pitch very well. Um, Randomly, Antonio Rudiger, I don't know, the last time he scored a goal or the last time he tried to even attempt a shot like that, he picks up the ball from 40 yards or so, bangs it, which kind of, you know, it's, it makes me think that there was a tactic from maybe the beginning that, you know, De Gea has been a bit shaky as of late. He smashes it. Pr- a pretty easy save for a quick keeper to make, especially in, a, a save easy enough for a keeper to make that the ball should go out for a corner. De Gea parries it right into the path of Marcus Alonso, who was incredibly high up the pitch, really. So, great, great um, tactical move from Chelsea. Um, and then uh, Marcus Alonso finishes it really well, actually. Tight angle and clips it in. It hits the inside of the post and rolls in. And it's 1-1. And from that moment on, you didn't really feel like we had any chance of coming back into the game. Um, we, it seems like Man United, at the, at the current stage we're at, as soon as, as soon as the team scores a goal, we don't necessarily have the metal or the fortitude or the intensity or the aggression or the grit needed in order to kind of um, level or to kind of win the game. We don't really seem like we have it in um, in a consistent basis. We do have, we've done it a couple of times in a season or a few times in a season, but it doesn't seem like we're able to do it a lot. And we just had that space where it just, it doesn't seem like it's going, it's going where it needs to be going. Um, and then the second half kind of, Developed into a bit of a damn squib, really. We didn't really get any more chances apart from that. No, Lingard had a good chance that he kind of missed. But again, I'm not really putting anything on that because he's not been good for a while. His form's been a bit up and down, so I'm not really going to chastise him too much about it. He's up, you know. He's having one of those times in his in his career where he kind of needs to really realise that he needs to pull his finger out. He's getting a bit older now. He's 26. He should be really in his pump and putting away chances like that. But that didn't happen. And then we started, and then we bring on McTominay, who I didn't agree with bringing him on because you know we needed to score a goal. Bringing on a defensive midfielder wasn't really a good idea, but credit credit where credit's due. McTominay came on and really went for it. He was running around, he was trying to bring the ball forward, he was passing forward, he was being aggressive. He really kind of lifted the spirit up a little bit, but it didn't last long. And then the kind of the game basically petered out and into like a one-one draw, which essentially guarantees Chelsea Champions League football. I'm not too bothered about the Champions League football stuff. I don't really get the insistence with some of the fans to get Champions League football. I think most of them, just because they want a night out, they want to go to a European tie, they want to go visit some of the best stadiums around Europe. I get it. But I think as a team, as a club, the last thing we need is to be rewarded for Champions League football with the way that we've been managed or mismanaged for the last six or so seasons. Um, I think from the boardroom level all the way down to the club, we need to take a hard look at ourselves and see the kind of mess we've got ourselves into. We hired a guy in David Moyes, who was a Sir Alex Ferguson clone. He didn't work out. We hired a guy in Van Gaal with a strong football philosophy and a way of playing. That didn't work out. We hired a serial winner in Rosa Mourinho. That didn't work out. There's something happening where the common denominator isn't the managers, it's the club. 
What are we doing to not facilitate or not help these managers? You could look at David Moyes and say he should have been part of a strenuous interview process. He shouldn't have been given a job just because experts were recommended to, right? We shouldn't have taken any work from experts. And you remember when there was a that talk that Arsenal Wenger was going to have a, a say in who was the next Arsenal manager, how the Arsenal um, uh, fan base freaked out. Admittedly so. You can't have an ex-manager who was, you know... Um, who was a failure for the most part, especially towards the end of his um, tenure there, have uh, any input into who gets a new job. Because, you know, how can we trust your opinion when you haven't been able to, you know, um, ace it in the league for quite a while? It didn't make any sense. And in general, it's a conflict of interest. It doesn't make any sense while you do that. You'd want to have a complete break, um, shake hands, say thank you for your service and go to another direction. Didn't happen. Van Gaal is a, is a manager who we probably should have invested the entire three seasons into, right? The style of play that he wanted, the fact that it required a lot of uh, mental acumen from the players, it required a lot of technical nows. It wasn't a system that would favour some of the players that are in our team. A lot of the players in our team hated Van Gaal because he was asking them to do extra work, saying about meetings and stuff. I think in terms of a cultural shift, in terms of how we understand the, how the game is played and position-based football, which is kind of what it's changing into now, you look at how Leicester performance against Arsenal, like amazing possession-based first football, you see that the way we're playing now is probably, you know, a little bit draconian. It's a little bit old school how we're playing on the counter-attack and just soaking up pressure and then trying to spring on the counter-attack. It doesn't really work that well. Look at what uh, Atletico Madrid can probably tell you that with, uh, with some assurance. So you kind of thought, you know, maybe we'd kind of invest three years into him. We didn't. We cut it short. Then Mourinho comes in and Mourinho's a manager we all know who needs a checkbook and needs a, the complete authority of a club in order to kind of make them successful. We didn't give that to him either. We undermined his authority. We didn't give him the money that he wanted. He invested poorly. That is truth to be said but also he just said he wanted to reinvest again he looked at the man city model and said hey look they signed a million fullbacks one didn't work out they just went out and signed another one right the carl walker thing and benjamin Medi is a good example right they signed benjamin Medi because he wasn't really sure or made up on carl walker look at john stones and laporte and stuff like that those kind of players you know i mean like like for like some um signings um you sign the other one to put more pressure on the other one to kind of keep the standards high doesn't happen so i think Champions League football would be the worst kind of reward. It would paper over the cracks and I don't think things will be addressed. I do don't think things will be addressed anyway. I think sometimes when the way things happen in the football club, it's not by coincidence. The fact that we've been failing for so long isn't by chance. I just think we're run by absolute dullards from the top to the bottom. Um, but I think in general, the last thing that anyone needs at that club is to get Champions League football. We don't need that right now. What, what we need is a team... Um, it's a club that knows what they're doing. It's a club that has a kind of direction of what they want to do, how they want to do things, and a real kind of plan, a long-term plan. A plan that doesn't... A plan that isn't emotional, a plan that's ruthless, a plan that has direction. I wouldn't be... I would I would be completely happy if the plan involved Solskjaer in some extent. If he fails along the line, then I also be, would be, wouldn't be too happy. I wouldn't be too um, um, upset if the plan that doesn't involve him either. But I want to see, I want to know there's a plan because I know deep down there isn't. I know if Solskjaer starts this next season of horrible and we're 10th place by Christmas, he's going to get sacked and we'll have no plan there. I know that for sure. That's a problem I have. And the talk now we have, you know, a news broke recently that Rio Ferdinand has joined the list of sporting director for Manchester United. Uh, they're looking at Mark, Mike Feeling as being director of football. It's just absolute bobbins, absolute bullshit that we're going through. For a club like Man United to be in such an array, such a disarray, such a mess is really scary. I'm hoping that the lack of Champions League football would guarantee us some kind of change, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, we might end up getting Europa League, which was not nothing, something that I don't want. I don't think most fans will want either. But I think we are where we are for a reason. We are where we are because we deserve to be. And I think everyone at the club needs to take some collective responsibility for what's happened basically at this football team and really try and make a change going forward. It's not going to happen because, you know, we're run by an absolute idiots and they don't know what they're doing. But you really hope that's going to happen. Um... This is the article about Rio Ferdinand being on a shortlist for it. Rio Ferdinand, Manchester United shortlist for director of football. Like, I don't get it. Like, what does that even... Why? Why would you do this? So why you just hire the best people for the job? It's just turned into a complete old boys club, right? Nothing's working. So let's just hire all our ex... For all our ex-players from all, from the most storied and um, trophy-littered uh, campaign and just get them all in and hope that works out. Like, right? Bloody hell, Rio Ferdinand has won several candidates to have spoken about the becoming the first sporting director of Sports Sky Sports News. United executive Ed Woodard has discussed his position with Ferdinand and wants to finalize an appointment before the next start of next season. United won a candidate who understands how the club works, which makes Ferdinand, who spent 12 years as a player in a club and an and attractive advocate, the person who fills the newly created role, expected to focus on the transfer market, the academy, and supporting the management team. Only got Solskjaer, who was appointed. 
is willing to work with the sporting director and has been involved in discussions regarding the recruitment. In contrast, social pieces, Jose Mourinho was against such an appointment during the time as a player. United, Ferdinand made 455. Look, man, I don't have any problem with him being on the shortlist, but you have to go for the best man for the job. I don't know what sporting director does. I don't know what football director, football director does, but I look at some of the other clubs around, around Europe and I want us just to copy their model. I don't want us to try and do our own thing and try and figure out the, our own way of doing things. Can we just maybe copy what other people are doing and maybe do that first? Is that possible, right? We've been we've been failing for so long anyway, as it is. Why the fuck are we trying to do something different than everyone else? Come on, man. Like, God almighty. But again, what do I know? Anyway, that, that was it. That was the game. That's, that's my match report. I'm not going to say too much of it. I just want to end the season to end and get it over and done with. We're horrible with shit. Everyone knows that. Let's keep it moving. Um... Next on the list here, what else I wanted to talk about? Let's get this off here. Let's just quickly scan through some of these uh, tabs before we move on to something else. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, yeah, cool. It's another article that I thought was interesting. Um, do you need to rinse your raw chicken? In a, Ian, Ina Garten weighs in on the popular food myth. So, the other day, I was... Um, during my weekly shopping, I went out to the shop as I usually do. I go and buy my vegetables and my salads and all that sort, so I can make my salad and all that malarkey and a bit of protein. I've been a bit, I've been in a bit of a rut at the moment with my, you know, food prep. I've been making the same thing over and over again: chicken seed salad, chicken seed salad, or chicken salad, whatever it may be, right? Something along those kind of lines where I get a salad, uh, add a protein or something into it, a fish cake, a fucking bit of chicken, um, some tuna. Or sometimes I had the salad on its own, whatever. I'm just having the same same old shit. Uh, but I've had a bit of a break from that stuff for maybe two weeks. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna do it again because I'm lazy. And I don't want to make new things. Anyway, so I went to the when I when I came back home, I was trying to prepare my chicken and you know marinate it and whatever and give it some seasoning. Um, and I said, you know, so do I need to wash my chicken? And I remember reading something online about you know washing chicken is a bit of a myth and it isn't true. You don't need to actually need to wash your chicken. But I remember growing up in my house, especially in like you know in a in an African household in a black household, you know. You not washing your chicken would is like sacrilege. You know, my mum would literally throw something at my head if I didn't do it. So um, I I remember that being like a big, big, big thing. You have to wash your chicken. You know, so I, I weighed in. You know, I thought, you know what, my mum, my mum knows some stuff. My mum's a smart lady, but the internet's smarter. So it's fun to find out what the actual truth of it is. And it and it kind of you know it pans out that you're not actually meant to wash your chicken. It's actually um unhygienic to do so, which is you know goes against everything I've kind of grown up knowing. This is an article from uh the t- today dot com. It says, "Do you need to rinse raw chicken?" Ina Garten weighs in on the popular food myth. Right. An article says the following: um, It's an age-old um, debate uh, that's been dividing the culinary community for decades. Should you ever rinse raw chicken before cooking it? One of the Americans' most beloved chefs, Julia Child, believed in washing uh, raw poultry. However, her legendary co-host, Jackie Pippin, on Julia Jack's Cooking at Home, famously disagreed, saying that the, the heat from the oven kills off any germs or bacteria. So which culinary co- master is correct? Um, this is it. A little clip here showing deep washer chicken. What's you saying? <laughs> um, during an episode of Food Network's Cook Like a Pro... Ina Gardson, a.k.a. the Barefoot Contessa, said that there's no need to wash poultry before you cook it. That Barefoot Contessa thing is super weird, isn't it? She walks around the kitchen making food barefooted and the camera will just like randomly pan to her feet. Like, is that what, because people are getting off on her cooking with her feet off or is that because she does that anyway? Like, I don't know. It's a bit strange. I don't really get that. It's like, um, it's like that, who's that, who's that lady? Um, The British lady who's like all like sultry and sexy and milfy with the dark hair. And he's zooming in, she's always like making face that she's gonna suck you suck you off or some shit. It's a bit weird. I'm I'm not really into that kind of thing. I just want you to make food. I'm not I'm I don't want I don't want my cookies just to be sexualized, especially with some woman called a barefoot con- contessa. It's like Eesh. it's like that it's like that English supply teacher everyone hated, isn't it? But anyway, who do I know? Um Da, 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 said there's no need to wash your poultry before you cook it breaking um breaking with child whom garden has cited as a major inspiration i know there's a whole debate about whether you wash your chicken or, or before you do this or you don't said garden as she prepared the rosso whole bird sorry julia it looks like garden and pippin have the food safety experts on their side too according to the food safety institute service of the united states the usada um prop uh you Uzda, usada, usada, whatever. Properly cooking a chicken will kill any bacteria, while washing it could actually um, have the opposite effect. 
Um, this guy, in technical, um, the technical information specialist told Today Food emphatically that you should not wash raw chicken due to the risk of potential cross-contamination of foodborne pathogens. Oh, wow. Like salmonella, which can be very da dangerous. The problem is that you can splash, which can cross-contaminate, said um, the expert, noting that the pathogens could land on foods that may not get cooked, like, um, cooked later, like veggies, or cling onto surfaces where they can linger. Washing is not really removing the bacteria. You will kill them when you cook them. For chicken, the thickest part of the meat should reach 165 degrees before it's safe to eat. So keep that meat for moments of handy. Ah, okay, there we go then. Still, uh, the idea of rinsing chicken is still debated amongst the pros. So they asked several chefs about it to wash all chicken. Um, Libby Summers, chef and crave culinary director of food delivery service Terra's Kitchen explained to today that she prefers to wash her chicken but for her it's not about the bacteria she's she just wants to remove any dirt um I grew up on a farm in Missouri okay cool that's what I'm saying just to kind of overall that's like when you get vegetables right like spring onions sometimes if they pull them out from the ground or if they if they are if they've been made you know if they've been fucking plucked from a ground in the first place they usually covered in some some kind of dirt sometimes carrots the same sort of way sometimes potatoes too just to kind of get the little the dirt off of it so you're not eating sand when you're making your food and shit I grew up on a farm in Missouri she said and the chicken co-mingled with the pigs and other animals that weren't the best at keeping up personal hygiene I always wash my chicken to ensure there's completely clean with no grit left yeah that's it basically restaurant and award-winning barbecue chef Melissa Cookstone is also a chicken washer I agree that the high temperatures will kill all the germs but I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> I wash thoroughly before cooking. This also gives me a chance to clean surfaces and seasoning. Yeah. So I think what the experts are saying about cross cross contamination is true. But I guess it's only true if you take your washed chicken with your hands that are also washing the chicken and immediately put that you know start cooking that and immediately move on to the veggies. But I think for the most part, even my mum, she wouldn't necessarily do that. She would she would wash the chicken, have it you know in a bowl now all washed. Wash your hands. Wash down the entire surface that you're what you're washing in. And then start making the other stuff. But I also, but I don't know how, how much you can guarantee the cross contamination doesn't happen. But now we know anyway. And now I know for the most part. We can rinse it to get rid of some of the dirt and all the gr grease and the grime and the, you know, the dust, whatever that might be on there. But in terms of washing it to make it edible, that probably is the best thing to do. But yeah. But imagine people out there that just don't put any seasoning in the chicken. Just get a chicken like that out of a packet and just chuck it into an oven. Salt and pepper in it when it's cooked. It's like, ugh. I at least get my chicken, massage it a little bit, put some slits inside it, you know, cover it in some olive, no, cover the bowl in some olive oil, put a lemon in it, a bit of garlic powder, you know, move it around in there for some bit, put maybe a bit of salt on top of it and leave it on the, in the fridge to kind of marinate for about 10 hours and shit and then put in a chick in the oven. I don't understand people that couldn't do that at all. You can even buy a bottle already pre-made with seasoning, can't you? I don't understand people that don't season their food. That's that's incredible. But anyway, now we know you don't need to wash your chicken. You can just use it like that. Thank you, today's show. That was super important. I hope that was valuable information to you too, podcast listeners. Um, let's get this off the screen. Let's get that off the screen. What else do we need to watch here that I wanted to talk about? Oh, the most important thing, isn't it? What am I, what am I doing here wasting all this time? Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 3. Have you watched it? I guess you have. If you haven't, major spoiler alert, major, major spoiler alert. Please turn off or please fast forward the show from this moment on. I'm going to be talking about Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 3. It just happened, right? The Longest Night. Wow. What an amazing TV show. Um... Of course, I've been watching Game of Thrones since the beginning, so it's a bit annoying seeing all the bandwagon people jump on it now as it's about to end. But it's also quite cool to see how um, the fan base has developed and grown over the years um, with the advent of social media, the fact that that's getting where it is now, the sharing of gifts, the dedicated forums and stuff. Um, um, podcasts are coming out. The plethora, the plethora of it of YouTube channels that you can watch to break down events that are happening in the show. Just incredible. I'm happy with how it's gone so far. Some people are getting a bit cringy about it, seeing all the bandwagon jumpers jump on it. Like, like so, Brendan Shaw, all of a sudden now is balls deep in fucking Game of Thrones when he, uh, you know, a few uh, just only a couple of years ago that he was like, ah, oh, I'm a grown man. I don't watch anything with dragons in it. Now look at him, he's fucking wearing Game of Thrones much. People are like the worst, it? but uh, I think Americans have that tendency in them anyway. They love to bandwagon jump on stuff. It's not such a taboo thing. I think in England, you'd be laughed out of the room with that sort of stuff, right? Because in America, they have that thing where they have like an East Coast team, a West Coast team. Like, it's like, what? 
we don't have none of that shit. We don't have like a, a team that support up north or down south. It's like, no, you support one team and that's it. Like, done. You make a choice. There's a shit choice. You just have to stick with it. Um, anyway, Game of Thrones ended, uh, or the, the, the longest battle scene ended that we've kind of seen in Game of Thrones history. I think it may be in TV history too. Um, and it finally put a, a full stop in the, in the saga of the Night King, the Night Walker, the White Walkers and the Waits. Um, and again, just an incredible show. I somehow avoided all the spoilers. I don't know how I did it because I ended up watching it the Monday evening. So yesterday night, I mean, I think it came on TV Monday morning, like 3 a.m. if you to watch it. It came on TV on Sunday in America for the most part, as it usually does. But it seemed like it was one of those episodes for them. It seems like it was one of the first episodes, maybe apart from Red Wedding and a few others, where people actually live streamed it. So I think you can watch it live streamed. I think on 3 a.m. in the morning if you live in the UK, 3 a.m. Sunday, Monday morning, basically. Um, which meant everyone on social media was kind of you know, talking about it and spreading it and spreading what basically happened. But somehow I managed to avoid it. I saw loads of thumbnails of Aya and the Night King, but I didn't know what happened. I didn't know whether or not the Night King um, abducted Aya in the hope of getting Bran. I don't know whether or not... I, I don't know what happened. Jeremy, I had no context. I just saw the, the thumbnail. I didn't, I didn't have any context of what would happen. And the show itself, it started off incredibly well, a very slow pace. I love the music, the cinematography. Um, I'm not I'm not mad at the darkness of it, right? A lot of people are complaining about it. I think if you watched the Game of Thrones from yesteryears, you'd know that they filmed like that on purpose to kind of uh, give it that extra effect, the added effect that, you know, it is actually medieval, or quote unquote, medieval times. Um, the lack of light was something that was, you know, um, fundamental to that kind of era. Um, where they are, the fact, you know, when you include magic, mysticism inside of it and it's a it's a really clever way of in, it's a really clever way of increasing the frightness the fright levels the thriller levels of the actual program without it just being gory and being you know ridiculously you know getting you jumping out of seat every two minutes just by lowering the fucking contrast and making it a little bit darker but then having all these incredible sounds people getting fucked up chopped cut um next being flying off here and head flying off here and there everywhere um that was a great part of it i love the the, the the scene with the dragons fighting in the air uh the night walker dragon and um, daenerys and um john fighting in the air too that was awesome um then falling off of it the battle with the dragons one dropping one falling on the floor the night king's dragons destroying winterfell for the most part smashing into fucking smithereens um the unsullied uh the dothraki going out first that scene oh with misandro lighting up all those swords that was incredible right so she, i guess when she went away she went away basically to maybe increase her powers and get more stronger because she came back and was able to kind of light up everyone's sword that was fucking incredible to see and then and then having that because it looked like they were quite scared i remember seeing a couple of videos where they said that the um, the dothraki are quite superstitious right they're afraid of magic in that sense so um seeing someone like a misandro would would have gave him hope uh, of kind of facing the night walkers but you know that scene was incredible she lit up all their flames all their swords sorry they kind of charged into the white walkers or the weights and then it was bit by bit the fucking lights went out like candles it's kind of similar to the scene where um cersei blows up the sept uh with the candle right as the guys kind of got trying to crawl across trying to blow up the candle and the candle kind of dims and then everything blows up it's sort of same similar sort of like connection with that one, right? The 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 fracky go in, flying head first into a brick full of whites, and then all of a sudden their flies will their fires will die out, and then you know the whites come out charging out, running at breakneck speed. Incredible to see that. Um, in general, just an amazing, amazing battle. Um, some bits I've picked out from the forums and stuff that I thought I wanted to share with you guys. Um, of course, you guys have seen the Burlington Bar reaction, which is fucking awesome. I think it's a bar in Chicago that sh that live streams a show. I'm not sure how they get away with it because I know sometimes um, the UFC and other people like that are a little bit finicky with people live streaming shows. I'm not sure if that is if this if it's not looked down upon as much as maybe sporting events. Maybe that might be a thing. I have no idea, but this is really incredible video that kind of shows uh, people getting absolutely hyped on the whole <laughs> Game of Thrones ending here at the Burlington show let me see if i can get it up and click on here to show it yep it's showing now hopefully you can hear it the piano was amazing though no this is the i think it's the final scene the piano is amazing oh so good he took so long to walk across though didn't he I think it's the second time only to use a piano. I think the, the first time was uh, again when uh, Cersei brought up the sept of um, that, you know, the sept with all the fucking finger people in it. Wow. 
Look at this. Wow. Hand up. And then that one turns around, discovers, and here there is Aya Stark saving the fucking day. Grabbed in the neck. So good. Drops it. Boom! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, you know? So cool. So fucking cool. Honestly, I was screaming. I was screaming in my room watching this. It was so amazing to see, man. So fucking cool. And of course, everything shatters. Wow. But yeah, an amazing scene. Probably one of my favorites of this entire um, season. And um, I don't know. I think for some people were a bit underwhelmed by it. Because I think, you know... Um, the Night King was a continuing threat from the very first season where to the beginning, right? They spoke about the Night King previously, when it's coming. The Night, um, uh, Ned Stark was convinced that they didn't exist. Um, and it was just a, there were just a, this threat that lingered in the background. I think a lot of people were pissed off that, you know, this, this kind of over, overbearing threat that was going to take out everybody was suddenly killed off in the first instance. Well, no, ki killed off straight away so easily, right? We kind of assumed, I don't know, I kind of assumed, um, wrongly that, Dragon Glass wouldn't kill the night the Night King. I don't know why I assumed that, but I just had a feeling that you know it wouldn't end this way. It'll go a bit more further than this. But I guess you know um, when you read deeper into it, you realize that the showrunners had decided that Arya Stark was going to be the one to kill the Night King. I think the reason why they had that was because um, she was the unexpected one, right? She started off being really scared and a bit of a you know a little bit alone in that regard. And I think what was the reason why they said that? I've read it. I've read what the reason, but I forgot anyway. But they decided three seasons ago she was going to she was going to be the one to kill. And then you know there's loads of foreshadowing bits of her with um Miss Sandra talking about she's gonna close brown eyes, which is the guy who arranged the red wedding thing. Um it was gonna be green eyes which is Cersei and blue eyes which is gonna be the Night King. So it's supposed to be that's the story. But if you read the books, no spoiler again, spoiler alert because I said at the beginning so already tuned out but if you read the books you would have known that i think in the books jamie lannis is the one that kills cersei's right she's the one that strangles he strangles cersei with a chain or some shit along the lines of like that so that's the reason why it happens that way but yeah great show awesome awesome see those kind of reactions i think i might go to a season finale of, of game of thrones 2 to watch it and that might be a similar sort of vein uh, going in the bone watch which might weird really because i don't think i don't know how it'd be watching a show like that in front of you know surrounded by those different people whether it's quiet where people are chatting shit It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, da, 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 da. The Night King smirking. That was an excellent fucking scene, right? You remember that? That was fucking cool, no? Seeing this fucking horrifying face staring back at you. Look at that. Mama Mia, right? That was... um. We should. I'm surprised that um, she didn't know, though. Does Darius... Was Darius not there when the Night King... I don't think she was, was she? No. Um, when Jung and, and Ko got attacked and the Night King kind of stepped through the fire as they were kind of approaching, right? He kind of walked through it. He doesn't get affected by fire. That was amazing to see, right? He kind of blasted it with dragon fire, which is which is funny because I think someone mentioned that it's a big deal because they use that dragon fire to make the, the fucking knives, right? So the fact that it couldn't affect the Night King was like, whoa, what the fuck? What kind of magical powers does this guy actually have? That was fucking cool to see. Um... And again, a little bit of personality. I thought we were going to hear him speak, really, when he walked up to Brown. I thought we were going to hear, like, blah, 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 some kind of ice kind of language. We didn't hear nothing. He doesn't really speak. There's no language there. But I thought we were going to hear it. That didn't transpire. What else we saw I thought was cool there? Da, 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 da. Blah, 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 blah. What else was cool? Of the list of things that happened on the show. Oh, there's something here that somebody knew a year ago, which was quite an interesting little piece here, right? So a year ago, someone had written this, I think on the forum too, talking about um, one year ago on Reddit, talking about how Aya will kill the Night King. It says the following, um, Aya will kill the Night King. The Valerian still dagger re re reappearing in the Stark storyline uh, is quite uh, conspicuously more than necessary for the Sansa Aya plotline. The useful Chekhov gun of N N Nymeria's wolf pack capable of running across snowy land without attracting attention from the whites. The general tendency of the show to frustrate expectation in interesting ways, no, uh, no t nothing will be as you are led to believe, which is true, isn't it? I, didn't, I honestly didn't think I will be the one to kill, especially the way they built the series up. The episode was fucking brilliant because it started off with Aya being fearless and not being scared of anything. Then she sees the night, um, the night walk, the White Walkers outside the gates and kind of fear strikes her heart. Then she starts to fight them and she starts to realize just how much of a daunting task it is. Then she starts to win and starts to get more confident. Then they start to overpower her and she starts to get 
this com um, less confident again, thinks she's gonna die. And then she's running through the entire castle, trying to find a hiding place. She can't escape, and it just keeps going on and on and on. She gets to a place where she finally is able to kind of get some solace, and they're stuck in a room together with the the hound and that guy that with the fire sword. And she says, Missandra again. And the Missandra, it basically becomes a faith. She becomes a lord of light, basically, to these people. She gives them faith again and makes them believe that, okay, cool, these prophecies that she's saying have some... Even though the prophecies don't always work out in the same way that, you know, the girl with the scar on her face, they kind of end up sacrificing her. That didn't work out the way it promised. The, 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 the vision that she gets gives them some kind of faith to hold on to. And I think that's all that she needed. And then, you know, when she says, oh, what do we see? What do we say when we stare death in the face? Like, not today. And she runs off. And then, of course, when she's running off, I guess the whole plan of that is to wait for the Night King to approach Bran and then jump out from out of nowhere and try and stab him in the neck. That was insane. Um, what else is it? The general theme, the Beric uh, Dorian, the number five Beric Dorian system for no plot purpose in that scene for reasons that Aya would not face. She would not could sneak past but yeah in general somebody knew a year ago that that was going to happen and it's true i think number four is the main thing right the general theme of the show to you know to all no sorry number three the general potential of the show to frustrate expectations which is true because i think that's what happened in general with the night king right we thought the night king was a big nemesis that everyone had to face but now what we realize in the show is that the actual big villain the bad guy that everyone needs to fucking be worried about is is cersei she killed her own people right um which led it in, which which never to be led to the her only child her only surviving child committing suicide in Tommen, um, and she's just completely heartless, right? She doesn't have any regard for anyone apart from herself. She used to care about her children, and she's that's the only people she's loved outside of maybe herself, her children, and Jamie. Um, her dad maybe for the most part, but he's dead. She hates her brother. She's plotting to assassinate her brother every single season. Um, she wants to kill every every enemy that comes around her. She wants to squash them like a fly. Just can, she's just ruthless. So I think what people know now is that she's the real threat to the Seven Kingdoms. So they need to get rid of her. But obviously she's got the fleet with Euron Greyjoy, um, naval ships and stuff, which have been an incredible advantage in these last season so far that we've seen in terms of war she's got the golden company that she's paid a lot of money to it's going to be a very interesting battle to see how that goes down in the next couple of seasons but supposedly um from the few things i've read online um the next couple of shows are going to be some of the best we're going to go back to the because i think a lot of people are complaining that um the, the i think the seventh and sixth season were a little bit too commercial they kind of um catered more to the general public they're a little bit more soppy and rom-com based Whereas the earlier seasons were better because of more political nature of it. There was loads of subplots going on at the same time. And I've heard that the last three episodes are going to be very, very... They're going to go back to the uh, Game of Thrones that we know and love. Loads of politics involved. Um, it's going to feel like a begin a beginning, a middle and an end. So four, five, six. They're just going to end really well. And again, I'm happy that it just, it's just going to end on the season. It feels like the natural conclusion for it to end. And I'm also happy that the next... The off the kind of... um. The shows that are going to come after this are going to be uh, prequels that are going to focus on particular characters, their kind of history coming up. That's going to be awesome. Um, what else do I have here on the list about Game of Thrones? And the last thing, um, the House of Mormont. You cannot ever, ever say that she didn't do the damn thing, man. I forgot her what her name was, but this character, um, she fucking smashed it. Juron Mormont too um, went out on his fucking sword and this young lady too went uh, on her fucking sword too. She was getting crushed by that giant literally breaking every single bone in her body and she still managed to fucking stab it in the eye with some um virulian st virulian store or steel or whatever it's called fucking awesome scene again one of the best shows i think i've watched in a while um i don't know if it's the best show because you know nowadays everyone's watching stuff on the internet we get to kind of sit down and watch it together but i think there is something there's something nice about the idea that it only comes out once a week and we will have to wait to watch it at the same sort of similar time even though some people watch it on a day and be watching the day after the, you know the weekend we all have to sit down and wait for this particular show to come on. I think it works out really well. Even in the era of streaming where things get uploaded, you know, in the entire season gets uploaded online, you've got to binge watch it. I think off, no, again, I'm not comparing the two shows, but I think with Game of Thrones and Star Trek Discovery, which I've been watching a lot on, on, on fucking game, on Netflix, which is one of my favorite sci-fi shows. I really like the idea that I have to check in every week to kind of watch a new episode. It's not obvious, it's obviously not the same level as Game of Thrones, but I think this might obviously kind of steer some show, some developers, some producers, some writers to kind of go in this direction. Not everything needs to be being watchy. Some things can grow and develop over time in this very convoluted way. Again, just an amazing show from costume design to set design to character art development. Like fucking awesome. Like Fionn Greyjoy, man. What an incredible character arc, right? Like he went from... And again, I think someone mentioned the other day, right? I think they showed him running into the White Walkers and eventually dying was like, you know, you don't need to be... Um, you don't need to have... It's a proof that you don't need 
he's had balls to be a man, right? He, he got castrated. Everything he associates with being a man got taken away from him. I think if you remember the early episodes, he was known for being having a really big dick. Um, that was part of his identity, you know, fucking loads of girls, being a man that way, and that got stripped away from him. He got kind of reduced to nothing. He had to build himself back up again. Redemption, saving his sister, going back and saving the um, the Starks who actually acted like a family to him. It was an amazing character to kind of finish it, and that actor fucking smashed it too. Again, one of my best shows, one of my favorite shows. I can't wait until the next episode. Next Sunday, um, what else is on this list? Let's keep it cracking on. We've actually done quite a bit this episode, and I've stocked, I've stacked up in mad topics. Oh, R.I.P. Present, man. R.I.P. Present, legendary um, London-based streetwear store or fashion store or menswear fashion store for the most part has suddenly and abruptly ceased trading. Now I don't know what's happening there. I guess um, there must be something happening with the company, maybe finances, maybe the lease was up, maybe the landlord. Um, bumped up their rent you know 10 times what it was i don't know what's happening but present is no longer around anymore man it really came out of the blue i haven't been to present in a while so i probably that's probably why i don't know any inside information because i know i knew a couple of people that used to work there and stuff and people are in and around who are associated with it so um but i guess from the outside looking in i would say it has something to do with the rent so i do the least because that location where presents on now has turned into probably one of the most you know the biggest hot spots like in maybe east london for the most part um I, f I remember when it first launched or when it first was founded, that area wasn't as popping as it was now. Nowadays, on any given weekend, you know, it's fucking teeming, packed with people. Just across the road, Ace Hotel is fucking packed. People going in there to have a drink, going in there to have a bit of a dance. The pub's next door to it. Dragon Bar, the one a bit further up. The blue one, I've got what the name is. Next to the bus stop is always rammed. The restaurant's on the other side, on the right-hand side. It's just an incredibly busy street. And I guess if you're a retailer, if you're a brand, if you're a store, it's a prime location for you to do whatever you want. I'm hoping it doesn't end up being a fucking brew dog pub, like um, what they turn birthdays into, right? Birthdays are like an institution in East London, one of the best bars to go to, especially for hip-hop, indie kind of acts, music you wanted to go see. Kind of like a... And in between place with uh, kind of like the new version of the old blue last it felt like birthdays was right nice little bar to go to dad a great little burger restaurant at the t um, on the top floor you can sit down have a burger and chill out just a great place you know and end up kind of you know that end up going away and now you've got a brudo pub in there just like you know just it, that is the sign of gentrification if ever i saw one so you're hoping the space gets taken up by somebody good but it's probably not going to happen but again it's another nail in the coffin for menswear stores in london by and large um we haven't really been blessed uh since most of the stores have been closing recently we've had these big big you know um i'd say dot com online stores like end clothing opening up shops here and there but they had they never really had the they never really had the same feel as some of the legendary london stores one of the place that you'd necessarily go to to go hang out to go chill speak to friends see what's new in store they didn't necessarily have the same buying um experience or taste as some of the stores that I present has some of the best brands in there and i don't know man it's just a sad space to be a, a fan of streetwear or menswear in general in london I know for myself, I don't necessarily buy things in physical stores anymore, so I'm not necessarily bemoaning the fact of not being able to buy stuff. But what I come from, I come from a school, a line of uh, people who, are, who went to stores not only to buy stuff, but went to stores to go and connect with your local community, right? Most of our things that we do in streetwear or in menswear are kind of relegated to the screen. Everything is online, right? Whether it's kind of buying stuff, whether it's finding out what's dropping, getting inside scoops, looking at lookbooks, line sheets, all online. The only time we get to suddenly go and touch and feel stuff is when they come in store. And sometimes, you know, you just want to go to a store to touch and feel what's coming in new. You want to go and connect to some friends that are also into what you're into. And, you know, just, just to connect and build a community because we didn't really have that, especially when most of it is based online. I guess for the most part, if you're a kid and, out, if you're a kid and you don't really like streetwear, because I think for streetwear has a good community into it right for the most part around it whether you're queuing outside supreme whether you're queuing outside foot patrol whether you're buying a plethora of shoes at dover street market it feels like streetwear has a, a bit of a community most of it is a, it's reseller base it seems like and i don't know how much how friendly those resellers are nowadays i know when i used to buy shoes resellers weren't the most friendly people in the world they were just you know they were just basically assassins that came in with a card and just bought up the entire size of a shoe and flipped it in the same day but I guess inside the reseller community, it probably is community, there's probably quite a good little scene there. But outside of that, menswear stuff, where are you going to connect to people that you like, that like the same sort of stuff, right? What ends up happening is that you end up going to a bar somewhere in East London, you end up seeing somebody wearing an amazing Capital jacket that you know, he knows you, he knows you know what it is, but you don't talk to each other, you just give yourself a little head nod. But you, you want to connect, you want to find out who that person is, you might end up being mates, you might end up swapping some stuff, you might end up giving you 
some information on where to get stuff, a stockist that you don't know about, a little undercover stockist that has all the size runs that um, all the fucking ASAP Rocky people haven't bought. Like, you don't know what what could happen when you meet people in real life. But, you know, when you take that away with Stolak like Present, with the iconic bench that they have featured here, it's just an upsetting state of affairs. Um, And the, the post says, Present, London has ceased trading. Thank you for your custom and support over the years. And just like a general statement here, same sort of thing. Uh, to all our customers, thank you for your support over the years. If you have any customer service related questions, you can still reach us on our link below. My link in bio. Fucking hell, man. Horrendous, right? Horrendous state of affairs. And I just hope going forward, the new generation kind of forge a way of somehow um, melding together these brand um, physical stores with an actual online presence somehow or the other. It's not going that direction. It feels like most brands, especially the internet brands out there who are selling stuff on Shopify and all that malarkey, tend to kind of steer towards pop-up stores to kind of, you know, get a quick buck or to maybe, you know, again, to try and harness the community that way. But I hope going forward, we do see more streetwear kids coming up. And instead of being infatuated about working at Nike, or getting free shoes. I hope some kids coming around nowadays with a passion. Again, I don't have the same passion for streetwear or for menswear. I did maybe in the past, so it's not something that I would necessarily want to do. But for the kids out there that are still really involved and are spending, you know, the majority of their money on clothes and they're going out in places and they're trying to find a new sports, so they're traveling to New York, they're going to Japan. I hope those kids get inspired and try and make and try and kind of carve their own bit of history and do their own stores. Because I think honestly, hideout. Um, even though in the beginning those guys were fucking cunts to me in the beginning when I went in, but you know, it got better over the time. Bond International, same sort of thing. Um, all these stores, they really played a big role in who I am today. Um, my education, my social group of friends, my taste, my interests, music, uh, literature. Like, it's unparalleled how much influence they've had on me as a kid growing up and being infatuated in this scene. Because back then, even, even now to some certain extent, you can't find everything out via the internet. Sometimes you don't really learn that well over the internet either. You could read an entire bio about double tax, but you don't necessarily, you won't necessarily know anything about Tetsu. Um, um, um at all right but sometimes going to a store and going to a store opening or a capsule launch if you if, if, imagine, if imagine if tech came to london to launch a particular collection that he's selling right and you got to talk to him or you got to see him in real life or you got to see people involved around double taps you got to see how small the team was you got to see what they did there maybe was a, a q a session those things are so invaluable to how you grow and how you learn the industry and the things that and if and it also contributes to what you might end up doing in the future you might end up discovering you know what i might I, instead of being a instead of being a brand owner i want to be um I want to be, um, I don't know, uh, what's this thing called? Um, I want to be an agency that kind of, you know, uh, buys in some of this stuff. I want to act as an agency that people can come to and say, hey, here's the brands I have. I want to be a, a showroom director. I want to be an agent. Um, I want to be a stockist. I want to be a merchandise. And there's loads of things that you can kind of educate yourself on if you go to these stores and actually speak to people involved. And you don't necessarily always need to be in the front line. You don't need to always be the, the person there, right? You can just be the cool guy at managing a shop that sits on a bench out, outside smoking a cigarette. That's an, also an integral part of the fucking scene. Super, super integral and i'm hoping going forward we see more brands doing the same thing um again as a sad state of affairs um again i'm um, r.i.p to present and um hope the people that worked there formerly the people that worked there still was those trading are able to bounce back on their feet because i know how it is to you know suddenly have a job and then not have it anymore because of things outside of your um control so again r.i.p present you you'll be gone but not forgotten and in a very legendary store with some legendary characters associated with it in around it for those that you know those that know know um yeah so r.i.p present gone but not forgotten next on the list here what do we have duh, 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 duh. oh the 13 best stop talking about stores i just list us online of the 13 best london sneaker and streetwear stores i haven't watched it all i walk quickly scan through it. it looks a bit wanky but let's watch it anyway and see what they say i'm sure it's not going to be as good as i'm hoping it's going to be but again you know let's see what the new talking about new generation right about what's happening out there what are the kids buying where they're buying it at i want to see what's going on here so let's watch this video and see what the kids are doing it's off the screen take this off take this off because again you want i don't know man i really i love going to stores and seeing stuff man i didn't want to you know and again anyway i don't know Let's, let's get this up here and check what they're saying anyway. So this is it, right? 13 best London streetwear stores and sneaker stores, right? Because I'd imagine just off the top of my head, there's probably more sneaker stores than there is streetwear stores, right? I'd, I'd say so. Wouldn't you say so? I'd say there's more than that. Than, I'd say so anyway. Let's, let's play this video and see what they're saying. This is a soul supply London store, guys. So I knew that... Oh, I hate them already. <laughs> 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 it really 
shouldn't matter though, really, should it? It really shouldn't matter. But in my head, I'm like, so what? You've been buying Yeezys for like four years. <laughs> and now suddenly you're giving people sneak wear street. Oh, man. That's one thing we didn't do that well in, did we, in streetwear. The bar of entry is quite low, isn't it? You just got to buy stuff, in it, And you're involved straight away. There is no... And again, I remember when I used to be on in street... Like, streetwear used to be fucking horrendous, man. I used to get bullied on forums for the stuff I used to buy. Like, fits I'd wear. Like, you no, know, they were mean, mate. They were brutal. Now, if you go on Basement or you go on some of these style pages where they post people's fits, they're really supportive for the most part, right? Kids are really nice. They really give each other encouragement. They, you know, they're suggesting things people should wear. Back in the day, they didn't suggest nothing. They'd suggest that you go and jump out of a window. They didn't want to give you any tips. And now you got these... Oh, God. Anyway. And what am I saying? What, do I want people to be more mean and make things more harder for everyone else? Yes, I do, actually. I do. I do. That's what I'm saying, right? It was difficult for me. I cried at home because I got bullied online from, from, from fucking 35-year-olds when I was 15. But, you know, whatever. Here we go. The best place is to cop your crepes in this. Ah, cringe! Cop your crepes. Come on, brother! <laughs> Let's get it. Oh. <laughs> Dead man. <brother. laughs> Ah, he's dead, bang, bang. He's going to take him out. Where are they going? Where are they taking him out? Like oh, yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to watch this whole thing. It's going to be so cringe. But again, bless these guys. It's no, it's no shade to those guys at all, right? You're doing your thing. But again, it's just funny to me, right? It's just for comedic purposes. This is not intended to be mean or anything. Um, Please excuse. I can't help but laugh at these things. Cause I just find it so ridiculous. You know, I grew up. I grew up with this stuff. I've seen the most wankiest of wankiest dudes, and I guess sometimes we just see the same character tropes being reinterpreted or come back to life again. It's just like, wow, man, these people, th these guys are still like this. It hasn't changed. They have. They are not. They're not less corny. They're as corny as I imagined they would be. It's just like, wow. Anyway, let's continue. And nothing wrong being corny either, you know? Do your thing. Right we are at end store, just down the road from Carnaby Street, ideal location, central, central. Uh, uh, Only come down here last year. And what are you thinking about the store? I mean, it looks amazing from the outside. Like, you really notice this from all angles. It is one of the best stores in this area. So Not hard to do, though, really, isn't it? Not hard to be the best store around Carnaby Street, really. Come on, if you're selling trainers, right? No? Not that difficult. You, you got to compete with size. Like, come on, man. Like, one of the best stores. All right, cool. What better than fucking shoe? Better than better, better than that, eh? Better than office. It's not really hard to do, really, is it? It's fucking Carnaby Street, man. It's the lowest common denominator. Well, let's get the There's store. a monkey down the road, mate. Like, come on. What the fuck do you expect? So, as soon as you come in, this is the contemporary section. This Ooh, contemporary. Stripes, side bags. Project. Look at that mannequin. You know, that's, that's why I don't want to wear bomber jackets anymore. The staple, the thing I like to wear, but immediately, everything on that kind of mannequin, I will not wear. Bucket hat, bomber jacket, hoodie, side bag. <sighs> Well We're such sheep, CDG aren't we? Play collection. We go all the way over to this CDG Play, yeah. We'll have some of those high heat trainers. But we're not talking the big, big brands. We're talking Acne Studios once again. Axel Arigato, Common Projects. All them shoes you can get into a club in. This is the section you need. Get into a club in. Who wants to... Brother, man. What are, what are these people? Who are these people? Who are these people? Shoes you want to get into a club in? Why don't you just wear shoes if you want to go to a, I don't know, that kind of club? Or just not wear those? Well, you can't go into a club wearing Yeezys. Show me a club in London that won't let you into Yeezys. And I'll show you a club that's losing money. Right? I, f I, don't, I don't think there's a night out in, in London, especially in that side of London, in central London, where there isn't a time where somebody's going to walk into a nightclub with a pair of Yeezys on. Whether they're an investment banker, whether they're a roadman, whether they're a DJ, whether they're an artist, influencer. There's not a night out in London where no one's wearing not one pair of Yeezys. And they're going to be nice, especially a clean pair. If, if, if you're, fair enough, you're not wearing a pair of Yeezys that you wear when you go and play football with your mates in a park and shit. But come on. Yeezys, really? Yeezys? You, you have to wear Acne Studios? You have to wear Common Projects to go to a nightclub? What the? What kind of nightclub are you going to, mate? Bloody hell. Found stuff I like already. Just from walking in, there's a nice ABC hoodie over there. Literally, I found something that I want to buy straight. Literally, did you? You found an ABC hoodie in a in a store in a store like Enclove. You found it. I'm I'm so, I'm shocked and surprised that you'd find an ABC in end. Really shocked. Wait, and a wallet in the glass container. But the best thing about this place, this is only the bottom floor. There's two floors of yeah. It's huge. It's yeah. unreal. So yeah. as we walk around, as you can see, everything's. <sighs> Have these guys never been to a shop before? Is this like a, a, a fucking paid piece or some shit? 
<laughs> it's unreal that there's two floors in one of the biggest stores in London. Um, you know, one of the biggest online stores in the UK suddenly opens up a shop, stocks it with all the brands they have online. And you're surprised that they have been able to afford such a big space. It's like, they've been doing their damn thing for a while, haven't they, End in Newcastle? No, they've been smashing it for ages. Their store in Newcastle, I think, is even bigger than this one. Industrial style. We have mirrors everywhere. We have the concrete look. The wood jumping shop in while we're here. He's enjoying himself. Some people call this like, I don't personally. You get to shop around. Ah, the cringe levels are just so high right now. We're trying to swap all on this floor. Same big company. One more people after Georgie. Don't worry, we're both fans of the Stony. That's upstairs, of course. Of course, the bands don't. Oh, jeez, every day. Is there? Is there? Any... I'm not keeping that. We keep it slowly. We keep it CP. Yeah, yeah, but look, really nice. Oh no, look. So end always nail it, don't they? Like, I like this backpack. No, they don't always nail it. Why do you say that they always nail it? They just buy all the brands that are out there on the, on the markets, put up what sells, put it put up online. If it sells, they double in and kind of buy more for the next season. They don't necessarily have a. I don't go to end for you know forward-thinking brands right they don't introduce me to new pieces i'm not like oh shocked that they've got this piece in everything that you'd expect and to have they have it's not the most forward-thinking brand in the world right if anything it's the it's probably the it's probably the the best version of commercial menswear streetwear that exists out at the moment right it's just that they just do it in a really clever way they appeal to like you know I, i'd assume footballers can go there rappers can go there influencers could go there actually people involved in the industry can go there so you know it's a pretty generic space i don't necessarily get oud and art i'm never on the end clothing side like whoa man they got that brand in like come on relax i like this duffel bag i quite like this backpack all right no i gotta skip this i quite like yeah okay cool i've got to skip some of this stuff this stuff and all this yeah, guys like, yeah, yeah as you guys may already know end are famous for their launches launches.endclothing.com um they're famous for launching shoes that no one can get having a convoluted registering system, um, um, you know, having launches for shoes that people don't even think is a launch. Um, they're launched, they're famous for that shit. It's just bullshit. It's just a way for them to gather your data and send you fucking nondescript um, uh, promotional emails that you ignore and fill into spam. Simple thing. Data gathering. That's what they're famous for. They have been killing the game when it comes, when it comes to high heat releases, releases for a lot of years now. now. But, but if, if you, you want to get, get your hands, hands on some instant, instant heat when you're in London, London sure ah, you're stop cool. with this, man. Down. Cop creps, instant heat, high level what? Shut up, man. Fuck. All the best accounts, the only accounts around. There's no other accounts out. What other accounts are there? The best accounts out. Like, what other accounts are there? They got the, the accounts that you see on your fucking Instagram discovery. What else other accounts do they have? The best accounts. As you know, we're not only a trainer page, page, but we do like like focus on our streetwear. So So this is also the streetwear section, so you have brands like Off-White, Heron Preston, Carhartt. LOL, like mentioning streetwear, and the first thing you mentioned is Off-White, Heron Preston, and Carhartt. Did they have any other brands there, apart from those bait free? Like, come on, man. God almighty. Fuck off. What fuck was it? Plenty. But then we've got brands such as Alexander McQueen, so it's got such a nice blend of these high heat reads. Oh. What's high heat? What the fuck is this phrase? High heat? High heat? What the fuck is this, man? What's what's this word turned into? What's a high heat item? Is there high heat, mid heat, low heat? What is that? What is low heat Reebok? Is mid heat? Um, I don't know. What's what's high heat? Acne? Because they keep mentioning that all the time. Low heat is Reebok, and mid heat is what? Champion? What? What are you trying to do, Zebra? <laughs> I haven't even seen this. This is pretty rowdy, isn't it? The material's really nice. <sighs> rowdy, fuck off! Oh, Couldn't trust. Well, that's where you're lucky. You can, of can course, of course, one of the dudes is wearing pin rolls and footscapes. Of course, know. but of course he is. But of course he's wearing pin rolls and footscapes. Of course. Oh, fucking good. Oh, 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 React 87s. Even more, even more obvious. Oh, God. Oh, no, it's- yeah, I mean, how, how, many many pairs, covered, man? how many pairs of these have you seen recently? Like, end have got a good. And I bet you got ten of them, mate. How many pairs of those? And um, he's talking about the Alexander McQueen <laughs> platform Stan Smiths. I'm pretty sure he's got eleven of them. He looks, he looks like a guy that would wear skin tight jeans with holes in the knees, and I don't know, and seventeen colorways of that same shoe. He's come up from, but uh, it was Love Island. Let us know if you agree. Swine. 
Japanese labels that we all know and love. A quick thing I want to... Like what? What Japanese is that? Let us know if you agree in the comments below. And why is he walking backwards like that for? I don't like. Is that that? Is that? Are they taking permission for the Kim Kardashian thing where she kept walking backwards? Just walk. Just walk and turn your head around, or walk towards the thing you're saying. And I don't. What's this? What's what's the what's with the walking backwards thing? This is like the Kim Kardashian seventy three or whatever hundred million questions they also invoke. Walking backwards, like, it's, a, it's a bizarre. Just walk forward, like, and just. <laughs> and then when <laughs> the place to come, there are no better places to shop for cool accessories. I can find quite a lot of places to shop better than that to go and get accessories then. Like really, for sure. No better place, really? No better place in Hall of London? Everything that you're buying let's, let's skip this a bit. This is getting on my nerves already. Is, is here. Hey, Jason, what's next door? Let's get out. my heart personally. These guys are the reason that I love sneakers and it was one of the first sneaker shops in central London. Offering you the highest heat from Nike, Adidas and everyone else. Highest heat? Why is the highest heat? Where is this phrase? The central visit. And they also do some really cool events such as the All Gone launch. All gone is a book that you guys need to be. What's wrong with you? As you can see, either side of me, crept absolutely everywhere. So don't be expecting to come down here paying £120 for a pair of off whites. It's not going to happen. Am I right? You've got the four or smiles on their faces, and um, you know, being able to see shoes that you've seen probably on the internet before and not physically uh, is always a great feeling for them. And you know. <laughs> And we're gonna try to sell the item during that period of time, the off contract, um, the 30 days. Well, the jungle to the street where it's in. This shop opened in 2015 and it's covered in my shop for heat, alright? So, you probably not gonna lie to you. And Fox Logo, they're a myth. They're gonna be gone on that Thursday. So, it's always well. We're now in Brewery Street in the heart of Soho outside Palace Skateboards. Founded in two. So they, did, they didn't even let them. They didn't even let them film in Palace. You see how wanky these guys are, right? They take all the money from these dullards, like these guys, right? These guys that go around and just buy, I don't know, things because some skater wore them, right? They, they're happy to take the money from these kids, happy to kind of have them queuing up, lining their pockets. But in the moment they want to give them love, film a bit in their shop. Guess what they say? No, you're not allowed to film in there. They didn't let. They didn't even let them film in Palace. And you guys go around supporting these sovereign wearing tracksuit bottoms with loafer wearing cunts. Like fuck off. Dumb nuts. Fast forward, Supreme's obviously under refurb, so they couldn't go in there. Sneakers and stuff. We're here in sneakers and stuff, London. This, you know, like the MX Deluxe, the one, the ninety. Good hands in here, and the staff are nice as well. They're really good people. And Leicester Square and Piccadilly Circus. The crepes that you want to be buying. And then did you all come through? Adidas are currently doing a camp. Okay, I can't anymore. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't do this anymore. This is too cringe. All right, cool. Um, that's too cringe. I I, I feel for you guys out there, um, sneakerheads and streetwear people who are out there trying to uh, forge a community and go to these events, whether the sneaker cons, whether the sneaker markets, whether it's store launches. I feel for you because these stores are garbage. The people that, especially the ones that are forward thinking, aren't necessarily trying to have you guys in there anyway because they're you know they're a little bit ashamed that they've got hype these fans are basically paying their rent for the most part case in point palace right they're probably ashamed that they have these kids as fans but you know they can't stop taking their money no problem about that whatsoever but i think in general it's a hard time to be a sneaker fan and have this be your scene they're all kind of sterile places no real personality no real direction there's probably the same shoes in each fucking store right there's no real direction of what they're buying nothing different on what it is Everything's limited nowadays because the brands are trying to fleece the kids out of their money and actually give them good products. Uh, the brands themselves don't really care about the community themselves. They flood the market with um, limited edition shoes, which then inflates the resale price of stuff. It's just an all cyclical game that all the kids are buying into for some reason because they all want to get a little bit of a come up on their resale value. I'm not involved in it. I stay out of it. I've already made my friends and my connection I need to make. I stay out of it. I'm on the outside looking in. I buy myself online. I'm an older dude. I don't necessarily need to make friends in this scene. And in general... I think it's an interest that I have. I don't, you know, my whole world doesn't revolve around it. I don't need to be in and around this scene to kind of feel like um, I'm taking part. I can just take part from buying the things that I'm buying, being interested in what I'm interested in, going to exhibitions, all this sort of stuff that is maybe closely adjacent to, but not is actually associated with. That's good enough for me. And even if I didn't have that, just buying the stuff anyway that I like to wear and going about my everyday life is good enough for me. But I feel, I feel, I feel for the kids nowadays. I think the most that they can do is stuff like the basement, which is good. I'm happy to see that. That's a real great community. It's again, it's a bit, it's a bit juvenile. It's a bit young for my liking, but I like to see how um, encouraging the kids are. I like to see how amazing and supportive they are. If someone gets lost and doesn't have any money, they all send money. They all send them PayPal to to get home on time. Like just great kids overall. Um, really good. Um, 
attitudes and stuff, whatever it may be, and very supportive. But for me personally, I don't want anything to do with it whatsoever. It's it's just cringe central. Um, I'm not trying to stand. It. I'm not trying to talk to somebody that's talking to me about highest heat and telling me what cop what crap I'm about to cop. Like, oh God Almighty, just saying that out of my lips feels nasty. Anyway. I think that might be it. That's episode number 187, 111, 1 Mac 10. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been an amazing episode as per usual. Um, I'm saying that myself because I'm an um, egomaniac. And I like to say everything that I do is amazing. That is where it should be. And it's my platform. I can say what I want. So go and jump out the window if you don't agree. Um, apart from that, if you want anything to do with myself, click my website, actuallyzinger.com, which is available in the link below. If you're watching via YouTube, click the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, let me know what you think. If you're what, listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review. That can go a long way in terms of people discovering the show that I'm making here for you guys. And... Apart from that, I guess I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. Um, Look after each other and be safe. Take care, guys. Peace.